Hello, everybody. I'm really delighted to be here, and thank you very much for inviting me. Can everybody hear me okay? So, in this paper, I want to expand really on Felicity's point about work at any cost. Drawn from my research on communities fighting the benefit system and also from the personal testimony of claimants, I've come to consider work itself as a central problem for mental health. The promotion of work, the work ethic, the enforcement of unpaid work and the imposition of the work cure, the whole sort of work is wonderful project that a growing number of professionals, including GPs as we heard earlier, um, are engaged in the so-called psychological benefits of work. Maybe your job doesn't provide an income you can live on or an income at all, but it's good for you in a psychosocial kind of a way. As Jeremy Hunt reminds us, it gives you a dignity and self-respect unattainable by those who don't work. I guess he should know. <laughs> These narratives about work contribute very centrally to the hostile environment experienced by people claiming benefits and to the sense of stigma and shame described in the findings of the de-stress project. The sense of being judged that Ray mentioned. Maybe it's time to think again about mental health and work. So I want to reflect on four themes. The mental health impact of changes in the benefit system, the rise of psychological fundamentalism, strongly influenced by positive psychology, the growth of the work cure, so work as a therapeutic goal, but I'm also going to talk about the resistance. As these developments affect the lives of more and more people, we're seeing growing solidarity between those who encounter work through misfitting it, a resurgence of anti-work politics, exposing the mythologies of work must pay, in the UK's low pay, no pay economy, people finding strength, as we heard earlier, through collective action. There's an overwhelming body of research, as, as we heard this morning, judicial reviews, high court rulings, parliamentary select committees, United Nations reports on the combined material and psychological impact of austerity. I'm not convinced by the holy grail of quality work. If good work really benefits employers, why is poor work on the increase? Factors which maintain a vast reservoir of distress among workers and which upon which employers routinely and profitably draw. But more than this, how moral narratives on work and benefits frame our judgment of other people and, of course, of ourselves. Don't look at it as three months left to live. See it more as a 12-week opportunity for fulfilling unpaid labour. George Osborne's parable of the shift worker rising in the early morning darkness while behind closed blinds, his neighbour sleeps off a life on benefits. I think it's important to recognise how pervasive this is, a kind of productivist ethos that denies value and meaning to any contribution out with the market. Of course, some people still remember a different tune. I ain't never going to work, get down in the dirt. I'm a soul boy, I'm a dull boy, take pleasure and leisure, I believe in joy. The discipline of psychology is nothing other than the discourse of production. So at the heart of everything that I'm describing, I think there's a psychological journey, one that you're required to embark upon. And it's interesting to see how many people don't take up psychological therapies and whether there could be a relationship between those two things. But what I think is going on is a kind of growing tendency to psychologise inequalities and to promote the idea that we can individually protect ourselves from precarity. So... In this story, inequalities in life chances, life outcomes in health, in income, employment, in status, they're explained less and less in terms of justice, so issues of wealth, power and privilege that Jessica was talking about, and more and more in terms of personality and attitude, so that kind of ostensible presence or absence of confidence, hope, optimism, aspiration, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I describe that as psychofundamentalism. Your life outcomes, your life chances, are all down to personality, and the discourses of assets, resilience, well-being, recovery, etc., are familiar side shoots of that. Why do we have to recover from our personalities? Employability 
isn't a set of skills or attributes required for a specific job. Rather, it's a generic, upbeat state that demonstrates an appropriate psychological profile, how to develop the right mindset that appeals to employers, as this course puts it, or a positive attitude is the foundation of employability, as the Confederation of British Industry puts it. Well, they would say that. For people claiming benefits, we're seeing a significant shift from what you have to do to get your benefits, apply for jobs, attend interviews, to what you have to be, drawn from that lexicon I showed you earlier. Um, there's a marked kind of change your attitude element in Department for Work and Pension contract specifications. These are the contracts, lucrative indeed, that are issued to welfare to work providers which should, I quote, address negative perceptions, instill a positive attitude to work. All new starts must attend an initial two-week course to develop their confidence. Innumerable courses via Job Centre Plus on how to motivate yourself, how to be positive, described aptly by one claimant as blame workshops. I think it's important to distinguish between this kind of synthetic confidence and happy, clappy, um, a job at any cost, um, self-esteem, and the true confidence and empowerment that comes through the sort of collective action we heard earlier, and I'll return to that in talking about the resistance. It's hardly possible to imagine a therapeutic goal that doesn't include employability these days. And I think what's happening is an intensive effort to escalate mandatory work cures. So the DWP, I quote, aspires to join up all public services to get local people back to work, including transport and housing. <laughs> So the DWP campaigns, for example, to persuade job seekers that a three-hour commute will expand your comfort zone as opposed to ruining your life and that of your children. <laughs> Health professionals will be central to, the, to all of this with a raft of measures supporting the imposition of work cures, so setting employment as a clinical outcome, allowing work coaches to directly update a patient's medical record jobs on prescription, so not social prescribing, but narrowing that down to the one approved outcome, a job. Terms like embed employment into the wiring of the healthcare system and integrating employment support into the map of medicine. At a time, of course, when for millions of people, work is less and less able to deliver either emotional satisfaction or an income that you can live on. The unstable boundaries between training and treatment. Do you have mental health problems that are a barrier to work and maybe a target for CBT in the job centre? Or is your pathology your attitude to work per se? The work-resistant personality or a willingness to violate norms concerning work identified helpfully by Perkins in the welfare tray. And these kind of books and this, these kind of... Um, pseudo-psychological um, analyses are the context in which communities make judgments um, about people who claim benefits. So within all this diagnosis labelling pathology, the emergence of unemployment as a psychological disorder, the co-option of therapies and psi workers to treat this disorder, in other words, using psychological constructs to produce failed citizens. So fit notes mean no one is sick. Work capability assessments mean no one is disabled. Universal credit means conditionality is expanded to those in work and the growing numbers of us, of course, who are forced to navigate that border zone between work and welfare. Here's an offer of employability support for those in work, an offer you are obliged to accept. So this is targeting low earners. And it's a very subtle distinction if you look at the DWP's la language that I, mean, I think Rose would be particularly aware of. Targeting low earners as opposed to targeting low pay, which might sound like some kind of socialist campaign. So here's an offer of employability support for those in work and offer you're obliged to accept. Because you do still get some universal credit, you will have to take part in the trial in order to keep your payments. So when you're claiming benefits, in terms of your participation in research, that's an ethics-free zone. It's a lucrative field. Here's Vedas and their 165K contract to tackle entrenched worklessness through sundials, laws of attraction, and positive thinking. 
So what we're facing now are measures that authorise state or state-contracted surveillance of psychological um, characteristics that permit the state to set therapeutic goals for those who are out of work, not working enough, not earning enough, and or failing to seek work with sufficient application. Paid work is often elusive or transitory, more like a moving target than a destination. And of course, that's the broader context for all these mandatory interventions. Reboot your soul or find a new system, as Dolly Sen says. And we are seeing new strategies for resistance and new forms of expressing solidarity. One example in London were a series of protests against talking therapies in job centres and job coaches in GP surgeries. So in this emerging coming <coughs> together to resist, the fight for sick pay in the gig economy also becomes a fight against pressurising claimants with health conditions to see a work coach, to stop health professionals using the fit note to force people back to work, to stop the use of WCA capability assessments to deny benefits to disabled people, to challenge the use of recovery stars that obscure structural inequalities. Because after all, what we're being invited to recover from is of course from being human, from being sick, disabled, sad, dysfunctional, in pain, vulnerable, dependent. So, and this is the crucial point, that we can despise all those people who still are these things. Working isn't working. Are you tired like we are of trying to convince yourself that what you're doing is of value and after failing in this, having to do it anyway? What should we do about work? We could abandon the pursuit of job readiness to stand on picket lines to demand a living wage and end to outsourcing. Is there a way that we can talk about work that refuses to despise those who don't, won't, can't work? As Kathy Weeks says, is the goal not work improved but work overcome? The job decenter decolonizing life from work Shall we refuse? Work is wonderful. With Dalla Costa, shall we say, we have already worked enough. Reflecting on this, I've come to the conclusion that perhaps the greatest contribution we can make to mental health is to challenge the work ethic, to refuse to participate in imposing the work cure, and to cease collaboration with its chief architects, the Department for Work and Pensions and their many agents. Thank you.